I believe there are seven or eight wrestlings most in the series, and we're going to yeah. release those the first Thursday of every month, and they're going to stay up here at youtube.com slash Casey Vault. Um, Sean, how did the Wrestling's Most series come about? There was a show on VH1. It was a countdown show. They would do, I don't know, most uh, most controversial songs or whatever. And it was a, it was a countdown show uh, hosted, well, not so much hosted, but but with celebrities commenting on um, on the, the countdown, they they didn't only do music. They actually did like 80s TV show countdown and movies. So they would have uh, performers from the pop culture uh, era that they were discussing come on and do the countdown and comment on on the items that were coming up in the countdown. So we said, well let's have a let's have a, a, a wrestling one and the way we were able to do it was we would shoot because we were shooting i mean at one time at our busiest we were doing 18 full-length shows a year i think that was the most stocked our release calendar was um so we have people coming through all the time i love the 80s thank you that yes. was uh, Salvatore threw that up there. And then that team eventually started out. They did a thing called Best Week Ever, and it was the same team. Oh, really? The okay. people liked that. Like I would call it their content farm, that it's like, let's do a decade show, but then let's also do just a weekly week, week in review show. Right. It's just talking heads. Like back when, right. back when a million people would watch something like that on regular TV every week. Right. So we figured let's do a half hour show. Let's do it. Or, or were they an hour? I don't know. You guys will tell me how long the uh, wrestling's most were. I think maybe they were an hour. Um, so rather than the regular two hour shows or the, the 90 minute shows, we'll do a short um, uh, one hour show where we did wrestling's most blank. So it would be uh, wrestling's most controversial moment, wrestling's most awful angle, wrestling's most awesome manager. So we, we would put it out to fans on our website and they would vote. They would get like three weeks to vote. We would direct them there. So the countdown was legit. It was entirely uh, fan driven. <clears throat> so at the end of those three weeks, whatever the results were, um, that was it. It, it. it went out and then we, we got to, to sit a talent down and do the countdown with them. And we would uh, we would do it usually after we do one of two ways after a shoot. Like, let's say we, we did a, a timeline fit Finley. Um, we would shoot the show and break, uh, change camera lighting, put up the green screen and do uh, read him the countdown and get his reactions to the countdowns. And so with fit there, we would do one whole season, which I think it was four per year. We would release one per quarter on the calendar so we would do the four countdown topics and have him react to the five uh in the countdown the other thing we would do is we often shot shows at conventions so we would leave a day or a portion of a day with the the wrestling's most set up in the corner we'd be doing timelines and you shoots over here but we had that over there so that when we had breaks in the production schedule, like in between a U shoot and a timeline, because I didn't have enough to do that day, <laughs> I, I, we try to grab a talent and run them in for a half hour and shoot uh, their their countdown segment. And then they'd go out and we grab another talent and run them in. And that allowed us to get access to people that had never been on KC shows, um, like Abyss. Uh, who at one point he was doing the Joe uh, Park thing, but um, I knew he was a fan and I knew they'd never let him do a full show. So, but we were able to run him in and get the countdowns for him. So he was able to appear on a KC uh, countdown show. So that's how we did those.
pro wrestling's inception, fans have needed a reason to come and buy a ticket. They needed someone to rally behind, a symbol of truth, justice, and babyface them. But who were the ones that resonated with you the most? In this countdown show, we'll count down your top five on that list and ask the stars of the ring, maybe some of them who are on that list, what they thought of your choices. So here we go. Here's your most over baby faces. In the MTV decade of the 80s, it was becoming necessary to be as visually interesting and colorful as anything else, and along came a guy that embodied that interesting visual quality and helped carry WCW into the 90s. Your fifth most over baby face was painted. You know, Sting is a good guy, everything, but when you're saying the top five baby faces of all time, no way. Sting was over. Sting's over. Maybe not as good as an interview for a baby face that you'd like to have, but he's popular. The younger Sting, the surfer Sting, whoo! Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You know, I, I do agree. Maybe, I, I haven't heard the rest of this list, but that might be a little low for him, actually. I mean, he's been an icon for a long time. I mean, he's been around, does the right things, good guy, you know. As long as he doesn't preach the Bible to you, sure, nice guy. Well, he's a good baby face. I, I, I wouldn't put him in the top five. Yeah, he's over. I mean, kids love him. You know, he gets a dress up at like Halloween every day. Halloween for him every day. He was over really big, and for a guy that was never in WWE, F, WWF, or WWE, number five is a good place for him on that list. And, and what is over? Is it over in that territory, or is it over by what everybody's standards are? Or is it over by his mind? He was over, but only regionally. I think when you say the most over baby face, but there again, he was regional, and I would have to say, and I talked about him the other night on my radio show, Tommy Rich was one of the most over baby faces of all time. And uh, uh, he was more of a regional over baby face. Uh, but I would have to put him on a list. Sting, yeah, at that point in time, but not now. Well, I think it was a visual thing. In the beginning, when Sting first came in from Mid-South into the NWA, people didn't give a crap who we were. We told Jim Crockett, make Sting a Brothers and Paint with us. Put him in six mans with Hawk and I. We'll help catapult this kid to the top for you. And they did that. We, we ended up wrestling six mans against the horsemen, and then Sting went off to do his own thing with Flair after that, and then he became an instant icon. You know, so I don't want to say we were totally responsible, but we were definitely part of responsibility because you had either they're going to let him go and fire him here, or we said, no, man, bring the kid along. He's all painted up. He's got the blonde hair. Make him a brothers in paint, and we'll see what we can do. Yeah, the, the paint, you know, that did it even before when he was, you know, all jacked up and always had a great body, always took care of himself, you know. So I think that's a big appeal, too. When you have somebody that's, you know, been in the business that long, still doing things, you know, always kept in great shape, looks good, appeals to kids, appeals to really anybody from grandma. <laughs> From a young to get, to, to get, you know, you got, you got to like the guy. He's just likable. That's it. He's likable. Everybody likes him. I don't, I don't know anybody that doesn't like him. Oh, there was a charisma about, about Sting, and there still is. Uh, and and he, connected with the, he connected with the fans, uh, especially with the kids. They all wanted to be little stingers. Just like the, the, the kids with Hulk, Hulk Hogan wanted to be Hulkamaniacs, everybody wanted to be a little stinger. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. I mean, I was so enveloped in um, WWF at the time, and WWE. Um, so I hardly watched any of, you know, anything else. But um, when you know about it, that's when you know, you know. People who are into wrestling, people who aren't into wrestling, they know those staples, and Sting's one of them. I was in the ring with him as a manager and as a wrestler during the heyday of the horsemen. And 
I remember situations where I was in the ring and Sting would, you know, knocked into the ring, he would come to the corner and I would have to tell him, how? Beat your chest. Now, when you're the heel, telling the baby face how to be the baby face that you know that these people are anticipating, nothing personal. But uh, if you'd have said number 55, I thought, uh, maybe. I think it's just an angle to try to get him a freaking break with Vince. <laughs> when my son Brandon, again, was uh, about 10 years old, I used to take him backstage at some of the WCW shows, and all the wrestlers, hey, how you doing, buddy? Sting would take Brandon into a dressing room with me and sit there for 10 minutes asking him how school was, uh, what he likes about wrestling, what he doesn't like about it. So they, they, he had a very personal connection because Brandon was probably not the first kid he did that with. He, had a, he, he really, you could tell that he was very uh, uh, enthralled by what people thought about him and the business and wanted to know why. Genuine A1 guy. Let me tell you, he, in the WCW locker room, he used to yell at people for cursing when his son was around. It's like, okay, well, your son shouldn't be in the locker room. This is the guy's room. So everybody had their mixed feelings about him at that time. He's a man's man, and uh, I've always respected him. I've always got along good with him. And uh, um, as far as in the business, he was always, he always rolled. He, uh, he was the top echelon of the business down at WCW for years. Um, but as far as his what he produced, you know, I got to call it like I see it. Ah. Middle of the card, middle of, middle to the top two thirds of the card. Anything is better in the 80s. Come on, I was born there. That's all you need to know. I personally liked the old sting with the buzz cut from the early years a lot better. I think the whole crow thing with the face is a little strange. It was a little morbid, a little strange for me. I'm not really into that whole kind of a gimmick. I don't know. But I guess, I mean, people like The Undertaker, people like that whole dark image too, so maybe that's why it was getting over. I think back to some stuff I saw back then, I thought he was awesome. You know, he had more, because he had fire, he had, he had that splash, he did the owl, and fucking plates came up. I don't really get the whole thing with the crow and the baseball bat. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get it. Then again, I don't really get anything TNA does for the most part. I think it was a vis visual stuff, and and he was uh, pretty good in the ring, and he had the the good uh, flying into the corner type thing, and hit the guy with the scorpion death lock, which was a, had a good name to the finish, and you know it all made for good television. A good looking guy, good interview, and you know he can uh, he entertain the the people that were on the TV, but you know. It, to be one of the top five baby faces of all time, that's pretty huge. And I don't believe, you know, not taking anything away from him, there's been so many other guys. Well, he was a character. He had charisma. He had a different look about him. Uh, you know, it's all about being different. Uh, he was an advocate worker. Uh, it wasn't anything dramatic. Um, I don't remember his interviews blaring out at me, but I wasn't around him that much. Um, you know, they were working with different companies. Uh, but top five, I mean, I can think of ten guys right now that I would put out there. He, you know, he had, he had success. Uh, you know, one of the great matches that I watched was in Baltimore when he and Flair wrestled, and I was hung above the ring in the uh, phone booth steel cage. So... He drew money. It wasn't a question of that. It's just, and I guess the overall question was most over babyface, but I'm still surprised that he was number five that high. To me, everything comes back full circle. So if I actually, again, not even being a big fan, if he came out with bleach blonde hair and a high and tight and some face paint doing some splashes and crazy shit, um, I'd probably even pop a little bit because the inner mark in me. But the last time I saw him work, uh, unfortunately, was uh, on YouTube on Botchamania with uh, with Jeff Hardy, and I think we all we all know how that that minute and forty two rode out. Sometimes you don't fall in love at first sight. In the case of your number four most over babyface, he'd have to work overtime to win you over. Well, after a wildly successful run, captivating and electric promos, you finally admitted he doesn't suck. Yes!
smell. I love doing that. Whoa. Is that all number four? I rate him up there really, really high. I would say he'd be one of the right up in there. That's correct. Wow, I would have thought The Rock would have probably been number one at this point. Let me do the Willie eyebrow at this point. And your name? It doesn't matter. Yes. The Rock, most definitely. That shows in uh, all the fans and throughout his still growing career. I don't know if he's in the top five. I'd say top 10, top 12. De deserving to be th that high. Uh, I haven't heard the, the rest of the countdown, so he's certainly deserving with what he accomplished. The guy is amazingly, super, um, ridiculously over. And that's based, on, based in part when he came back this year for WrestleMania. He came out, cut the same promo he cut 10 years ago, verbatim, and that place ate it up like he never lost a step. It was fucking amazing. The Rock's one of those uh, baby faces that come along once in a great while. The it factor baby face. Yes, he's over, over, over because he talks in the third person and he's just over. I, he is over, over, uh, I, you can't say anything else. I'm gonna say it, if you didn't hear me, over. He's just cool. He is cool, even I think he's cool and I'm pretty damn cool myself. Oh, Rocky. It gave women something to look at. I think this was the beginning of when females started watching wrestling. Like before that, it was just men in their basement and random old people like my grandma that watches still to this day. Um, now there's women all the time. Like I talk to people out in Los Angeles that know nothing about wrestling, but they do know The Rock and they do know the people's elbow, or the people's elbow and the people's eyebrow. So yeah, go on Rock. But I do think you probably should have made it up higher in the list. You know, there's over baby faces, then there's the it factor guys, and very you can count all the it factor guys probably on two hands ever in this business. Personally, I think what elevated him to that status was um, the character that was developed for him. Um, that made him stand apart. That's when he really started to soar in popularity along with the writers, with the writing, came his personality. And um, you know that's when he started with his quick little insults and his phrases, and that's what really got him over. He knows how to get himself over. And uh, that's first and foremost. You gotta get yourself over. And uh, growing up like he did watching Peter Maivia, who was a, in my eyes, a loose cannon, a uh, Samoan that would love you one minute and be screaming over here the next minute, make everybody shit their pants. That's what Peter Maivia would do. And then his wife, Leah, the Rock's grandmother, she was tougher than Peter. So now, when these two guys are fighting, you got, it doesn't matter if the room's full of 270 pound wrestlers, they're all assholes are puckering up to the wall or a seat or something because they're all scared to death because Peter Maivia and his wife Leah are fighting. And there's, there's uh, Dewey, excuse me, Dwayne. Don't beat me up for saying that, Dewey. <laughs> I, I said it again. There's Dewey walking around, playing, doing whatever his, his old hat to him. Doesn't face him a bit. I've known The Rock since he was probably about seven or eight years old. And he and I used to, uh, uh, one time we were up in the Catskill Mountains and uh, his dad, Rocky Johnson, was running a show. And uh, little Dwayne came over to me and started talking to me. And we started exchanging wrestling imitations. And I, I beat him on Dusty Rhodes. I know that. I knew that kid when he was seven, eight years old. Um, he was always listening. He was always quiet and watching everything. Doesn't surprise me a bit. It amazes me to see what he's done with his life. Um, he deserves it all. He's third generation in the business, and uh, and he's freaking, uh, he's took it to a whole new level. You know, I mean, he's gotten out of it, but when he even comes back, you know, he's, he's awesome. He's awesome. Never did I think that this guy, this little shy kid, would connect with an audience the way he did, but the timing was perfect. From Rocky Sucks 
uh, all the way to him becoming the, the, one of the biggest baby faces in history. There is an electricity about that man that just shoots out that you can feel anytime you're watching him, either on TV or in person. He's one of the few guys that when you're at home watching him on TV, you feel like you're watching him live in person. When he first started, he was just in the training school. So Tom Pritchard and Chris Candido were his trainers. They had the ring set up in the studio up in Stanford. And I was filming TV shows three days a week in the studio. So three days a week after their class, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you know, Chris would, and I would go out to dinner. We went to this little pizza place, had a great Italian menu. And I said to him, because he was such a nice guy, I'm like, Dwayne, why don't you come out to eat with us? He was like, no, you know what? He goes, I, don't, I really don't have extra, any extra money to spend. I've got canned tuna fish back at the apartment. He was sharing an apartment with four other guys at the time and living on canned tuna fish. So I'm like, listen, you're a 300 pound guy. You can't live on canned tuna fish alone. So come out. For, so for like six months, Chris and I bought him dinner three nights a week just because we, we didn't want him to starve to death, you know? And they weren't paying a lot for developmental back then. It wasn't even called developmental back then. And, uh, but uh, he was great. He was so appreciative. And yeah, go ahead and ask him. He got the chicken Montanara every single time we went for six months straight, three days a week. He came in. He was hired. He and Mark Henry at the same time. And I remember setting him up in an apartment where uh, they had a place to live while they were going to be trained. And then I left the organization and kind of had a chance to watch the, the evolution of The Rock from Rocky Maivia that sounded good on paper. You talk about ideas where Rocky Johnson, his father, and Samoan High Chief Peter Maivia, his grandfather, Rocky Maivia, boy, it just sounds so natural. And it was great to everybody but the fans. And he fell on his face, not because of, of anything that he lacked, but it just wasn't his, it wasn't him. He needed something that he, could hold on to, and once he started the, the catchphrases and the raising the eyebrow, then he had something, and that's what the people grabbed hold of. Well, you know, he cuts great interviews. People, I mean, when he talks, everybody listens. Everybody listens because it's one, entertaining, two, he's great with a microphone. You know, and just he's fun to watch. You always know when he comes out, he will not stumble over words. He will not whatever. Whatever, he just, he's got it. And he is, yeah, he should be way higher. Because I already know who's number one, so I'm gonna say he should way be number two. First of all, he, got an, he, he turned an elbow, a standing elbow drop into a finish. I mean, you know, that's, 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 pretty, that's, pretty, that's pretty amazing in itself. Uh, but I mean, just his, his, he can cut a promo all day. It's the most, probably the, probably the best promo man ever. I, I, you know. Uh, you know, right, right a niche below Randy Savage, who pretty much does everything better in my book. The Rock was hot, and it didn't matter that his moves never, ever connected. That's okay. I think they connect more now, maybe. I haven't really watched. The guy is very entertaining, and he's somebody that the people kind of get sucked into to want to see, and that's, uh, that's the baby face material. Well, I mean, he was a good-looking guy. He was a... Uh... Good body. Well, I don't think he was a great worker. I mean, most of the things I saw from him was right-sided only. He came on fast and went straight to the top right away after a year or so of just being a, uh, an undercard guy and has achieved so much success as a babyface outside the business that he's such a big babyface, they had to bring him back for the WrestleMania. Uh, you know, they didn't have anybody in the company that could take that part. They had to bring him back, and he'd been gone for, what, five years or so? So uh, I would actually rate him a little higher. He was so good on the mic. Like, there isn't any of that anymore. People get on the microphone. They're like, and I thought that you were mean. I don't like you. I just was watching the other day. I was like, no, get off my TV. You're making me talk like a robot. So he talked good on the mic, like really good, like amazingly good. And he had all these phrases that nobody has anymore. Everybody's now, I hate you. I hate you too. He was, you know, fun and exciting and beautiful and tan, really tan, or maybe just Hawaiian, I don't know. Um, so yeah, people liked him because he was a good talker more than anything, I think. Charismatic. Um. He's in the movie, so I guess that has an overcarry. 
and it just shows WWE's inability to create huge stars in the last 10 years. You know what I mean? They nobody, you know, you got your you got your Orton and your Cena, but they're not Rock or Austin over, uh, and that's that's scary that he can come back and, and be that super over. And uh, so I want to see where three, two, and one goes because he's probably be a little higher on my list. Oh, he's. I mean, that's effective. I don't. I didn't. There's a lot of guys. That I, I mean, I had a chance to work with a lot of good baby faces that were smooth and. Uh, uh, able to draw the crowd in. I don't think that in in his case, I don't think that the people actually ever thought that he needed their support and help. My my impression of a baby face is that heel's tearing the shit out of this guy. And without the support of the fans, you know, he's not going to make it. And I don't think, I mean, he's popular, but I, he's not a Tommy Rich or a Somebody like that, that, my God, if we don't get behind this guy, he's going to get killed. That's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at it from a heel's perspective. This guy burst onto the scene in the early 80s and was the blueprint babyface. No frills, no gimmicks. He had the physique, the demeanor, and the athleticism. His in-ring work is responsible for many matches that would top a most exciting matches list. Your number three baby face, Ricky Steamboat. Definitely Ricky Steamboat. The guy can work unbelievable. He's a, a, a good guy. It's somebody that every heel would want to work with. And I think he was known all over the world for you know, how he, how his matches were, you wanted to watch his matches. This is a little biased, because I think Ricky Steamboat's the best of all time, babyface. I can argue that. I could take the point of argument with that, but I'm not going to, because Ricky Steamboat, in my eyes, is the epitome of a gentleman, of a man, of a babyface. Steamboat was good. I mean, uh... I worked with Steamboat a lot of times. Um, there again, you're talking about the top five. I would say Tommy Rich should be up in there. I mean, maybe he is. Maybe he's in, uh, he's in the top ten of all time. Doesn't surprise me if that's high. Uh, I would say great baby face as far as in ring ability, but as far as being over, I think he's a little. Uh, I think it, I think he, somebody put him on that list a little higher than he should be. One of the greatest white, now there's a different baby face. That's a white meat baby face. For his heir, good. I mean, he was the same, the same. I mean, I'm, I know of Ricky and seen some of his stuff because people that have seen any of my past interviews realize that I never watched wrestling growing up. I was lucky and was in the right place at the right time. So I never watched a lot of that, but have seen footage of him and just the way he moves and the way he, you know, same thing again, physical appearance it was great. He would have that charisma charm. You know, he had a charm to him that people dug. Uh, now that surprises me, and I'm a big Ricky Steamboat fan, but it surprises me that he is above the rock. I, I, I would have to put, uh, I'd put Rock way ahead of Steamboat uh, because Rock, uh, and there again, I, I, I would even put uh, a guy like Tommy Rich ahead uh, of, of Ricky Steamboat. Steamboat was not that big of a baby face in the WWF days. He was uh, underneath mid-card guy with the Intercontinental Championship. Now, does that make you a great baby face? Was he, was he good? Yes, he was. Jimmy Snooker was a great baby face when I worked with him. Uh, and I'm not knocking Ricky's work at all, but when you put it in perspective with great baby face, Dusty Rhodes was a great baby face in his era. Uh, so, so there was a, I don't know, the fans are kind of off a little bit on that list. Well, Ricky, again, there was a good looking guy. Um, smooth, good interviewer, sincere interviewer. And there's the case of the individuals you've already talked to. The people actually thought that they had to get behind Ricky. Because if he didn't, Murdoch was going to beat the crap out of him. Uh, So-and-so was going to beat the crap out of him. So we got to give him some support. Mulligan was going to tear his throat out. So let's cheer for him. Come on. 
and he would respond by listening to that and, and coming up and making a little comeback and firing up, firing up. So they felt they're actively involved in that match. That's important. Ricky was a white meat Indian kid that you could beat to death and people know he can take it, but they're also waiting for the comeback. So Ricky's, Ricky's your momentum builder in a match. One of the most silent, charismatic people I've ever met in my life. He's not a big or a great talker. He's an intelligent man. He's got a, a quiet charisma about him and legions of fans. Uh, and I think, you know, when he was the dragon in the uh, WWF, that was probably his most overtime. But I'm surprised that he's one notch over the rock. He just had that, that personality and that charisma out there that just captivated people, I thought. And it wasn't just because he was a good looking guy. Uh, he just had that, just that presence in the ring that people just were drawn to. And I mean, not only that, he could tell a story. He went out there, his psychology was fantastic. Like I said, he had the best arm drag in the business. Nobody's ever touched it. And um, just something about him just you know, made you watch him. And uh, I, th I just thought he was one of the best. Still do. Oh, I miss him. I miss him. Um, he should also be up there on the list. He should be like number one. Your best arm drag and baby face ever in the business, ever, was Ricky Steamboat. Ricky Steamboat and I, uh, like a lot of other wrestlers, uh, uh, like to do wrestling imitations. And Ricky, Ricky loves my Pedro Morales. I would go, I am ready for any kind of action, baby. So anytime Ricky Steamboat would see me and the other guy that did this was Bobby Heenan, would see me at ringside as he'd getting into the ring. He'd look around the ring, he'd see me with my camera at ringside, and he'd go. One other time uh, with Ricky Steamboat, we did this around the horn in the Carolinas. Every time he'd wrestle Ernie Ladd, Steamboat would come into mad screaming and applause, and they'd be stalking each other, and he'd see me at ringside, and he'd come over and shake my hand, go like this, hey, Ricky, and the fans would go, yay. Ernie Lane would come over two minutes later to do that, and I'd pull the Ric Flair hand on him and go like this. And we did that, and Ernie Lane would go crazy, and Ricky Steamboat would start. So we did that everywhere, probably for about a year. He took such time. In 1980, when I was in North Carolina, I just broke into business, and uh, it was my first territory. Took time to help me, because I was this green guy coming up, and he would help me with my work in the ring, and I was an up-and-coming babyface at that time, so, um, yeah, it was, uh, hey, I love him, I love him like a brother, and I'll do anything in the world for him, actually. Ricky Steamboat's the man, except I won't put him over again. Well, you knew you were going to have a great match, you knew you weren't going to get hurt, and you knew you were going to, you know, if you were going to go 20 minutes, you know it was 20 minutes from top to bottom. It wasn't sit down and relax for 10 minutes and have a match. It, it, you knew you were going to work, and that was the best feeling in the world when you could have a match like that. He's your 60-minute baby face. He can kick ass. He can get his butt kicked. He can kick butt and then get his butt kicked. The next thing you know, you stop him at the 40-minute mark. Now you're killing him. Next thing you know, then they believe he could pull out the win at 60 minutes. That's Ricky. He was right up there. If, if Flair is asked who his greatest opponent was, uh, uh, usually uh, the, 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 the pat answer is Rick Steamboat because he could do anything in the ring. He had the athleticism, had the look, and uh, any time that the other wrestlers come out after their matches and after their dress and sit down to watch, that, that makes a statement. And Ricky Steamboat had that kind of ability. WrestleMania 3 is probably one of my favorite matches of all time with him and Randy Savage and, and, and the fact that he always uh, fought not to lose and fought to win and it looked like he was fighting an uphill battle and just his comebacks and, and his facials and the way he worked was was amazing. But as far as um, even even in relevance, like if you take where he was in 1984 or five, whenever that run was, to even The Rock now, I don't think they compare four and three. I think, uh, I think Ricky Steamboat's a little higher in that list, maybe top 10 of all time but I wouldn't go top five. I, I mean, just being in the ring with him and learning different things from him every now and again, or when he was teaching the other girls, Ricky Steamboat, um, it just, I don't know, you could just see it on him. And you just loved that face of his. And you loved how he moved and how, and you just, you believed him. You believed that he could really kick some ass. And he's a nice guy, a super nice guy. So I agree. You'll be, interviewing, you'll be interviewing Sonny coming in here in a little while, and you have to give Sonny a hard time because 
Sonny, Ricky Steamboat was her man when she was a little girl, man. She loved Ricky Steamboat. <gasps> How do you know about me and Ricky Steamboat? The only thing I know about Ricky Steamboat is his legend, you know? So when I got into wrestling, I really didn't know a lot of old school. But, um, you know, his name is, still comes up over and over. Who told you? Joe, didn't he? Animal told you. Diligence. Animal stooged me off, didn't he? A month ago at WrestleMania, we're standing there, me, Animal, and Ricky, and I, it was only the first time I actually really spent any time talking to Ricky. And when I was a kid, he was like my favorite. I had the biggest crush on him when I was like 10 years old, favorite baby face. I, and I, I had told Joe all this ahead of time. So we're standing there talking, and Joe goes, Animal, Animal goes, Ricky, you know, when she was 10 or, or 13, I forget what it was, she had the biggest crush on you. She said you were the best baby face ever and it had the smoothest dra um, arm drag in the business. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me! He totally just humiliated me and embarrassed me right there the night after Hall of Fame at WrestleMania to Ricky Steamboat. Ricky attracted the young girls and he attracted the white meat babyface people, you know? Wasn't the hardcore babyface like Hawk and I were. Weren't too many young girls with pigtails coming after us or, or grandmas wanting to kiss babies. We, we, we just had the rebel guys at 20 years old and they'd kill them, you know? This is, okay, this is how bad it was when I was a kid. I used to sit there in my room and practice writing my first name with his last name. That's how corny I was. But I was 10. <laughs> I was 10 years old. <laughs> but oh yeah, he was, he was dreamy back then. He still is, even at his age. Today, top baby faces transcend the wrestling business. They need to be marketable to the masses. Movies, TV guide covers, talk shows. The biggest names in wrestling had better be big names outside wrestling as well. And man, was your number two most over baby face ever that. We're not talking about work. We're talking about popularity, right? Well, he'd probably have to be in the top ten, I guess. Wow, I was looking for him to be number one. Son, he probably feels he should have been number one. Well, you know, when you're saying all of these guys, I mean, there's Jimmy Snuka, there's, uh, it just, the list goes on and on and on and on, and you're bringing up the guys just in that little era right there. And Steve Austin, unbelievable, you know. So, uh, you know, I'll say yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Austin was right there, yeah, because uh, he achieved great success by, by being that cutting edge baby face that would do the kiss my ass, oh hell yeah, and drink beer, and it got over with a certain segment of population. There again, they have to bring him back to WrestleMania because they have no baby faces that's over at all, so they bring back two of the best baby faces of all time and put them in the WrestleMania. I think Steve Austin is what I think most men can relate to in the audience. And what I mean by that is most guys, when they've had a few beers, are badasses. Most guys, if they keep their, you know, their, their shaving in a, in a Fu Manchu or a goatee and shave their head, think they're badasses. I think most guys that uh, are rebels without a cause or rebels with a cause, that's, you know, they all want to be, every, every guy wants to be a Steve Austin. One of the great babyface heels of all time. He took this, I, I, I met him back in Texas when he first started and he had the long flowing blonde hair. And yeah, he was a heel like everybody else, but he defined the attitude era. And although he was a babyface, he was a heel because everything that was uh, pro-society, he was against. And they really thought the audience would take him as a heel, I think. He smashed that, that boundary of um, heel babyface. You know what I mean? At that time, they were still trying to push, you know, wrestling was always starting to push um, good guy versus bad guy, good versus evil uh, kind of thing. And he was a heel that got over and never changed. And he kept being a heel, and now nobody gave a shit about the heel baby face dynamic, you know what I mean? I think he's pretty much the one who smashed that. And now it's very hard to get heel heat unless you're a true heel because, like I said, there's a guy anti-establishment, drinking beer on TV, flipping people off, beating up his boss, 
and the place is eating it up. So, I mean, he smashed that dynamic of heel babyface, and, and from then there was no good or evil anymore. And more of the, since then, if you notice, more of the bigger, bigger heels are the bigger babyfaces to this day. Well, from my perspective as a heel, you look at babyfaces like somebody, you're going to go over there and rip their body apart unless the fans stand over and give them a defense wall. Then you can't get around to them. Then the fans are helping them. Some of these guys, I mean, you can go boing, bing, bing, toe to toe, toe to toe. They don't really need the help. Andre, if Andre, my estimation, one of the top baby faces, why? Oh, he's so big, you didn't need help. Andre had the fans right here. They would cheer, come on, Andre, come on. So if they believed that they were helping Andre, isn't that pretty good? Wow, he's special. And he, uh, Boy, I don't know what, I, I can't say enough about him. He's got it. He, you know, he's, the, the talking wise is great. His attitude is great. People dig him because he's what everybody, every person in America, except for Vince and Donald Trump, want to tell their bosses <laughs> because they have no bosses. But they, that's what he, everybody could relate with him. Everybody related with him because he did what everybody wanted to do. Give it to your boss. And he did it. Night in, night out. People loved him. He attracts that kind of, you know, the ass kicker in everybody. Everybody's got an ass kicker in them somewhere. Steve Austin just brings it out. Steve Austin, based on the fact that he does nothing besides come out on a forerunner and you hear broken glass and the place goes ape shit, is, is pretty amazing. He was the first one to, to beat up Vince McMahon. Nobody could ever touch Vince McMahon. And you're going to get over if you, if you do that, because Vince was the hottest thing going. Everybody wanted to hit him. And he finally got to do it for the fans. And, you know, the beer and the language and all that, and that was kind of the hardcore stuff getting on national TV. And uh, he was really good at doing it. And when you get over that big like that, you're going to be one of the top baby faces. The guy doesn't have to take a bump for, never had, hasn't had to take a bump in about 15 years, can just hit a stunner throw up some middle fingers and the place goes nuts. And you can't deny that. Um, again, I, I think you know, it's based as far as, as, like I said, him and Rock in the last 10 years are probably the most, probably most over guys in the last couple of decades. So yeah, he belongs right in the top five. I remember him with the beer truck coming in the arena and <laughs> they, you know, you have mental, somebody says Steve Austin. That's the first thing that comes to my mind watching that and how over the top that is, but very typical of him and his character. Super, super nice guy, and what you see on TV is really kind of Steve Austin, but he's you know a little bit more reserved than that. Good, good guy. Yeah, Steve, he's a lot of fun. He came in with attitude, and he was always, um, you know, he's cool. There's like nothing fake about him, you know? His character is a lot like him. Very down-to-earth guy saved his money, and maybe what set him apart from a lot of the others is that he had the courage, for lack of a better word, to step out of the box of what the quote unquote office envisioned for him and what they thought his character uh, should have been. And he didn't allow himself to be confined by those limitations and was willing to, to step out and then the success spoke for itself. Steve's very real. So when he would cut a promo or he would say something about somebody, it wasn't, you know, all hokey and kind of corny. You could really see Steve saying something like that and his mannerisms and the way he talks. It's, it's very real. I, I think it fit his personality. I think it fit him. I think it fit his rough and tumble ways that, that he was not stunning Steve Austin when he was WCW. That did not fit him. It just was not him. Uh, the, the ringmaster, uh, he did have his head shaved. He did dress in the black. He did go out and he worked and he worked hard uh, as, a, as a rough and tumble worker like a Greg Valentine. But it wasn't until he got the stone cold and I don't give a damn and hell yeah and was able to do that that his the real character came out. It was, it was believable to the fans. That's what made the, the Attitude Era in the 90s and you know, late to, or early 2000s, whatever, good rock.
Stone Cold Steve Austin, you know, D Generation X, those guys. There's just something that bonded with everybody and gelled when though, even when those two guys are Steve by himself, he's that defiant, you know, what everybody wants to do. I know everybody's heard it, but it's what everybody wants to do. I want to walk in the office and tell my boss to kiss my ass, and if you don't like it, what? Well, if you don't like it, what? <laughs> and he was so pissed off all the time at everything. And people like that. People want to hear people pissed off because it lets their pissed offness come out too. He kicked ass. Like, I believe the man would shoot you in the face. Like, you don't always get that. Sometimes they're a little metrosexual for me. The wrestlers with the tan and the, the, the hair and the, the ab spray and the little, then they walk around in their underwear and then it's just, you know. Where Stone Cold Steve Austin was a man. Like, I like a man. And yeah, so that's what he had. Like, guys weren't like, does he really like my penis? You know, it was more, <laughs> you knew he was a dude. Just saying. The shaved head look getting rid of the blonde thing so he looked like every other bad guy, and the way he talked. The way he talked. Everybody listened when he talked. He can be funny, but yet yeah, he's very cool. And, um, well, he's a great ass kicker, and he always did his cool stuff, you know, like he'd always drive the big trucks or you know, do something outrageous. Boy, just like The Rock. Again, you'd be sitting at home or in the arena and you were live right there with Stone Cold Steve Austin and that's the way Bill Apter said so. I got, actually got him his first break in uh, WCW. Dusty was hiring me when I did the Big Josh thing. Steve Austin, I talked him and his wife into driving with me to Atlanta. Dusty was just taking over the book. I said, you're ready. He goes, I'm not ready. I go, you're ready. I'm not ready. I said, if you keep saying that, you're not gonna be ready. You're ready, trust me, you're ready. So that night, Jeannie, his wife then, and him and I jumped into the 3D ZX, drove to Atlanta. A week later, I was hired, and a month later, Steve Austin was hired. Well, just, yeah, just like Rocky, I said, they're two, probably, in my opinion, the two best baby faces we've ever had. Uh, Steve is another guy, he's never changed. He's still, you know, just Steve Williams, he's just an awesome, you know, Texas boy. Uh, another story about him. <laughs> he started out, he was the ringmaster, and back then I was on top of the world. I was in first class. The only people that flew first class back then were me, Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart, and Undertaker. Everybody else was in coach. So there's Stone Cold Steve Austin, while well, he was still the ringmaster, back in coach. Well, US Air used to give upgrade certificates, and I used to have a ton of them, because we flew so much. So I used to upgrade Chris, and Owen Hart, and Steve Austin. I'd have them all up front with me. So one time the flight attendant, she was like, uh, ma'am, you're only allowed to upgrade one companion, and I was like, but they're all my boyfriends, you can't make me choose. And she was just like, she didn't know what to do, so she was like, okay, and she just walked away. So many a flight, I upgraded Steve Austin so he wouldn't be stuck in coach. And then when he found out that I had an expense account and I didn't have to pay for my own rental car, he started hopping in my car every single time we got off a plane. So yeah, so I, I carried Steve a little bit too when he was making peanuts. <laughs> so there's, I used to feed the rock and I used to let Steve Austin use my rental car so he wouldn't have to spend the money. I remember this situation when he was struggling he was like fighting to make a living, to fighting to feed his own self. And uh, we were in Memphis one night, and, uh, I, and I was standing with Robert Fuller, and Steve Austin was walking away, and his, his jeans were real baggy on him, hanging off of his butt, you know. And I said to him, I said, hey, Austin, I said, why don't you wash them jeans and fit your ass a little better? And he turned around and said, now from 20, 30 yards away, he said, I'm not making enough money to eat. I've been eating raw potatoes for two weeks. And he turned around and walked away. And I went, oh, whoa. And it hit me, and I remembered that. Years and years later, Steve Austin and I are sitting, standing by the ring at a Monday Night Raw 15-year anniversary, talking about it, where his, how his career's gone. And I would just t tell him about The Condemned. I just thought that movie was great. I was telling him I thought, I thought it was great. And he brought that up. And I remembered it too. It stuck in my mind, but it stuck in his too. And I went, whoa, whoa. I said, I remember that, brother. Stone Cold. <laughs> I got the entire experience when I was 19 years old. And I was in Rockford, Illinois. And it was maybe like my, my third or fourth 
live wrestling show. And there I was in a white tank top, and I got beer poured all over me. And let me just tell you, I was screaming louder than anybody else there. But before that, I had actually flashed the Hardys because I was in love. But then I was there, and there was Stone Cold Steve Austin, and he was going crazy, and I wanted to throw him beers, even though I had no beers. And it was wonderful. And then I got sprayed down by him. And I couldn't even do the right things that I was supposed to do because I was so in awe. I was like, really? I'm in the ring, and there's Stone Cold Steve Austin, and he's spraying me down with beer. It was amazing and exhilarating. And yeah, I get hot just thinking about it. The list we gave you to vote from started with a ton of names. San Martino, Inoki, Dusty, Cena, Brett, Lawler, and we're down to five and now down to one. With 29% of your vote, you agreed that the most over babyface ever, the guy that got rabid fans pouring into arenas, buying foam fingers, and tearing off t-shirts in the schoolyard, was Hulk Hogan. Yeah, I don't think there's any question about that. Another one's spot on. Oh, you got me there. You know, I was going to say Shawn Michaels. Definitely the truth. Hulk Hogan brought it all to a whole different level. The, the man. He is the man. Well, let me tell you something, dude. This is Hulk Hogan, brother. And tonight, when the smoke clears and the, rain and the dust settles, it'll be Hulk Hogan standing over you. One, two, that impression sucks. Well, you know something, brother. I knew you were going for that, man. And how can you deny it? Um, yeah, you know what? It's timing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no doubt about that. Thank, thank, thank God for Rocky, you know? When he left Vern Gagne and went to New York after the Rocky movie, that just made him. And I mean, he was you know, 340 pounds of muscle and bleached blonde, good looking kid when he started and he beat every single person in wrestling. And you wanted to work an angle with him so you could make all the money. And he was the guy. He completely changed wrestling. Went from little territories everywhere to the big territory. And that's what it was. You know, that doesn't surprise me because I worked with him a long time and never had a problem with him when I was in a position of authority and, and had to deal with him. And uh, of course, he reached his, his highest level when he was with the, the WWF. And he did a lot of his business personally with Vince. He was the only one that, that, that did so. I agree with that. I mean, I'm surprised that Flair's not on there, or, you know, I'm, uh, I'm trying to think who else should have made the, the list. Cena? Should Cena have made it? Um, Cena's like a company man. And as much as I love John, I love him to pieces. I think he's one of the hardest working people on the planet. He does every single charity thing. He, he works in movies. Um, sometimes being a company man actually it, it makes you less diverse. If you just took that second to just be like, F you, whoever the man is at the time, Vince or Johnny or whoever, if you just took that one split second to do it, I think people would love you for it just a little bit more. I was the first guy and the only guy to press slam Hulk Hogan over my head in Japan. Um, it was Hulk Hogan and Tenryu again, talk and I. So you had four baby faces in the ring, which was very strange in Japan to do. I didn't have that much of a relationship with Terry. Terry was supposed to uh, was asked to work with me in WrestleMania 9, and he absolutely would not. And that sealed the deal with me as far as how I think about him. Uh, yeah, and he was a pretty bland guy at a lot of times. Uh, and when you see the early tapes of him in, um, in Memphis, he wasn't that char charismatic. But it takes a great director to find the substance behind an actor. And that's exactly what happened here. The great director was Vince McMahon and his guys. And they found something that would click in this guy. And it may have started, sorry Vince, but it may have started 
you know, with Hulk and Vern Gagne kind of, you know, starting that out in the AWA. The conversation always was, well, Vince thought he made Hulk Hogan. Many said, well, Hulk Hogan thinks he made Vince McMahon. And I think the truth lies somewhere in between. Without Vince's TV, then there wouldn't have been Hogan. So everything, it all, you need both of them. Vince saw something in Hulk, gave him the opportunity, and then Hulk ran with it and became as big as he was. And the end result is the, the two of them became very, very successful as a result. I think the two coexisted very well. They, they ran the business end of it, Vince did, to perfection with him. I think he took, he had, Vince probably always had a vision, and he did it even with Austin, and he did it with The Rock, he did it with The Undertaker, he did it with, with, with Shawn Michaels, he did it with Bret Hart. He has a way to take that one person and put all that time and effort into marketing that one person, and he's done it with John Cena now, and market that one person and get the wrestling fans and the public to gravitate to them, to buy their merchandise, to buy their videos, to come to the arenas and see them, to buy the pay-per-views to see them. And Hogan was the person who was bigger than life. Big head on him, blonde hair, tan, big guy, hell of a talker, good worker in the ring. I'm not going to take that away from him either. He, he did what in the ring what he had to do to make the fans come out to see him. The whole changeover of pro wrestling to sports entertainment really started with Hulkamania. But, but, I was on an a, uh, the biography of Hulk Hogan and at the end of the show I said if it wasn't for Hulk Hogan wrestling wouldn't be what it is today. And then we did a second take and they didn't use it. So I'm going to say what that was here. I said on the second take, what I really wanted to say was, if it wasn't for Hulk Hogan and Vince McMahon in perfect concert with each other, we wouldn't have what we have today. So whether you like it or hate it, what wrestling became into sports entertainment is that it was the two of them that catapulted Hulk Hogan to become the top babyface in the world. Because without that promotional machine behind the character like any other character in any other business of show business that's not going to happen unless you have the, the right machine and Vince McMahon was the perfect machine to get help get Hogan to that top. Ric Flair might have been the greatest in-ring uh, worker of all time Hulk Hogan and his popularity and his and, and, the, and the, the, the marketability and that monster that it became made wrestling a, a, a marketable mainstream uh, we're going to buy our toys and put them in your house kind of thing. I think that's what put us on the map. And, and even when he came back, NWO, NWO tried to be the heels. But Hulk Hogan, Rock, in that middle of the ring, that WrestleMania where they were standing off, still to this day, you know, Rock's supposed to be babyface, but Hulk Hogan, they, people wanted to see Hulk Hogan win that because he was still uh, amazingly over. He had charisma, talk, body, yeah, and been in the business forever. And he's just somebody that, you know, fans dug, Wrestling people that are in the business dig because he's just, he's wrestling. You know, he is wrestling. Hulk Hogan's another one. He had the colors. He had the fun. He would talk to you like this, brother. And like, he, so he had that, hey, I could talk on the mic and, and sure, not always my moves don't connect, but that's okay because I wear lots of feathers and that kind of hides things sometimes. Hulk Hogan is Hulk Hogan. He paved the way for all of us. I love Hulk Hogan, who doesn't? He changed the way Madison Avenue looked at wrestling as far as marketing. He changed the way that uh, national television looked at wrestling. He changed the way wrestling was looked. He had an impact on a generation of people. He was the Muhammad Ali. He was the Tiger Woods. He was the, any, whoever the President of the United States might be. Hulk Hogan is the most recognizable one of the most recognizable characters on this planet. And for that, he changed our, our, our lives as professional wrestlers. He's the guy that paved ways for, for guys like Hawk and I that let everybody believe that 300-pound uh, muscle heads can be more than just muscle heads. Now we can be athletes, too. He set the bar for everybody. He 
paved the way for everybody. I'm going to go ahead as much as say if it wasn't for Hulk Hogan, wrestling kind of might not be where it is, and other guys wouldn't. He led a mark and a standard in wrestling at the time to where all the way up to the Attitude Era before Rock and Steve and whoever, um, that that was wrestling. He was wrestling. If you, if you watch wrestling, it was Hulk Hogan. Who does everybody know? Uh, you know, yeah, everybody knows Rock, Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Undertaker. They know, you know, but if you ask somebody that is so ignorant to wrestling, hey, do you know any wrestling thing? He goes, um, Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan. Well, Hogan changed the, changed the business, I think, with the support. And, you know, it's uh, one time we were in a dress room and someone said, put on the marquee tonight, wrestling. Hulk Hogan, no opponent. It's going to sell out. Has to be somebody working with him. Has to be the undercard. It's the pyramid. And at that time, the pyramid was, this foundation was strong. Hogan was over. I mean, you got to give him credit. Hogan's probably in the top five. Like I said, I was the biggest Hulkamaniac when I was a kid. So if I was 10 years old and you asked me this, I would say absolutely Hulk Hogan, the biggest baby face ever. Of course, with my knowledge throughout the years, like I said, that had changed. I think Rocky and Steve actually surpassed that. I do, but um, I mean, he's always will be one of the all-time best. I mean, you can't argue with Hulkamania, you know? I remember when I was a kid, there was no Hulk Hogan. There was no Andre. There was a Bruno. There was a Crush Lasowski. Mm, a lot of other guys. So it depends on what generation you're talking to. I hated Hulkamania, man, growing up. I was a macho maniac all the way. I was always anti-establishment. That's why I live in New Jersey and hate every local team there is. Um, but growing up, man, you know, I got grounded. I got grounded as a kid because I stayed up to watch MSG on TV and uh, Macho Man versus Hogan for the world title. He had his ribs taped up because Bundy just done a number on him. Lumberjack match, Macho Man throws out Hogan. Don Morocco and somebody else, I think, hold Hogan against the post. Bundy comes in, avalanche against the post, rolls Hogan in, elbow one, two. Are you fucking kidding me? I jumped up out of my seat going, this is fucking bullshit. This is bullshit. My mother comes in and sees a TV on, no TV for a month. And that, from right then on, I knew I hated that motherfucker. But you know what? Nobody can deny, you know, he made a living out of making everybody else's finishes irrelevant. I remember one time I was in the Meadowlands in Jersey and uh, he finished a match I think against Sergeant Slaughter. It was all full of blood and I always had the same aisle seats every time I had to have aisle seats. I was like neurotic. So he was leaving the ring and I hit his shoulder and I had a handful of blood. I was like, oh my God, all go in blood. And I made a handprint on the program and I I think it's still at my mom's house in the basement to this day. But yeah, that's how much of a Hulkamania guy was. Hulkamania, you couldn't deny it. At that time, it was the biggest fucking thing ever. And, uh, and, and, I, and every time one of my favorites wrestled Hulk Hogan on TV, I hated it because I knew there was no way, once he hit his finish, that they were, gonna, that they were going to, uh, I knew they were gonna, he was gonna kick out. And everybody knew it. And I, I, I actually would look around when I would see pay-per-views at people who would say, uh, that were surprised when he would kick out of something because you knew it was going to happen. And WrestleMania six, when he actually actually missed a leg drop and a warrior beat him, was still amazing to me because I you didn't see it. Nobody saw that one coming. But in its day, at, at, at its you know at its foremost, Hulk Hogan was Hulkamania at its at its peak. Made wrestling undoubtedly the most over single babyface ever in the history of the wrestling business, and who be one of these entities that you'll never be able to replace. I don't care what Stone Cold says, or The Rock, or, or Cena, or anybody. Hulk Hogan sold more tickets in his career than any other wrestler alive. Before we start this, and you know, you're talking about wrestling's most over babyface, and I was told uh, by, by, by the producers of this show, they said, Bruno, you're not over. As, you know, I was a babyface, doggone it, before babyfaces were even, and I sold out Madison Square Garden before Madison Square Garden. I didn't need entrance music. My entrance music was 21,000 fans saying, Bruno, Bruno, Bruno. So if I'm not on this list, it's just because a lot of the fans from when I started are dead. Okay, that's it.